Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure everybody's all burned out from Luminaria, but we've got something to, to light everybody's minds up to, again with something exciting, and that's our program this afternoon. Uh, most of you know me. I'm David Rubin, the Brown Foundation Curator of Contemporary Art here at SAMA. And before I introduce our special guest, uh, a few announcements. The first of which is, is, if you have not already done so, please silence your cell phone. I want to thank the sponsors of the San Antonio-based sponsors of the exhibition, The Missing Piece, Art is Considered the Dalai Lama, the Sui Denman Exhibition Endowment, the Helen and Everett H. Jones Exhibition Endowment, Claudia and David Ladinson, Sama Contemporaries, the Marsha and Otto Kohler Foundation, Dr. Jane Appleby, and the Alice Claybird Reynolds Foundation. I also want to once again extend a warm welcome to uh, many of the artists and the head of the Missing Peace Project who are here with us this afternoon, Darlene Markovich, if you just want to let people know who you are. She started the whole thing, dreamed up the idea for the show, and we're so honored, we're so honored to be the, the closing venue after a five-year Ten City tour. Um, the exhibition here runs through July 31st. We have a number of programs coming up. Uh, the first one I do want to announce, um, Pat Steer was supposed to be speaking here on March 29th, but it's going to be rescheduled. She had a family emergency and so won't be able to make it at that time. However, she's still very anxious to come and sit in the chair here and have a dialogue with us. So um, watch your email, watch our website. Those will probably be the best vehicles for us to let you know uh, the new date for that program. On March 28th at 6 p.m. and 8 p.m., we're going to present our ongoing series, Music on the Move. Uh, and this will be the first one that focuses on contemporary art. And there'll be uh, basically uh, musicians uh, moving around the museum, first in the contemporary galleries and also in the Missing Piece exhibition, playing music that was chosen to relate to the artwork. And then uh, May 3rd, uh, we'll, at 6.30 p.m., will be a conversation with Adam Fuss, uh, a photographer who's in the Missing Piece exhibition. And on June 5th, we will have, uh, from 1 to 5 p.m., uh, first Sundays for families with a focus on the missing piece, so uh, parents and children can uh, participate together with interactive, hands-on activities, making mandalas and various other um, projects relating to the themes in the exhibition. Um, and then finally, if you haven't picked up the rack card, uh, be sure and take one of these. Um, they're in two locations in the exhibition. They give you instructions on how to participate in the Monitor Peace Project. You can also go directly to the SAMA website for that, and that's a project that allows anyone from anywhere in the world to share their text messages of peace and images of peace with all of us here in San Antonio. The images will appear simultaneously on the twin monitors that you see in the Great Hall and on the SAMA website, and it will be cumulative, so it'll become richer and richer as time goes on, and hopefully we'll be able to archive it and, and keep it going in some fashion after the show has left. And, uh, and then the uh, mobile phone app, you, you'll notice that by the text panels introducing each section, there are phone icons with a number on them and the address uh, sharepeace.samuseum.org. Just go to that address on your phone and it will take you to a site where you can take the Missing Piece virtual tour and you can hear uh, for every section myself talking about what you're going to see in the section, so hopefully that will add something to the experience for you all. Okay, well, this is a great honor for me because I'm reuniting tonight with a gentleman, or today with a gentleman that I had not seen since the 1980s, I believe, when I worked in San Francisco, and um, I'm very honored to introduce William T. Wiley. Welcome. And what we're going to do is kind of take a little walk through uh, Bill Wiley's life and art, and we're going <laughs> to we're going to start with where it all began in Bedford, Indiana, and uh, ask you to talk a little bit about your childhood days and right. your origins. Well, the first thing I want to say is thank you for having me down here. It's our pleasure. And the next thing I want to say is hats off to San Antonio because uh, museum is just a knockout collection. I, had, I got over here early and 
took a look through the whole thing and uh, boy, no flies on you guys. <laughs> yeah, it's really beautiful, beautiful stuff. So, uh, yeah, born in Indiana, Hoosier. <laughs> and um, and then uh, where did you go to school and uh, what was your family life like and when did you start making art? Did you make an art as a kid? Yeah, pretty much as a kid. Uh, didn't have TV in those days and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, radio shows in the afternoon, uh, mm -hmm. Tom Mix and Sky King. And so would you draw while you listened to them? Yeah, I'd lay on the floor listening to uh, radio and, uh, and draw. And uh, so I didn't have any formal art training for quite a quite So you a really were self-taught from the beginning, yeah. Oh, like most of us. <laughs> yeah. And then your high school, though, you had a really uh, influential art teacher, teacher, and you had moved by then, right, to um, uh, Washington? Washington, to, to Richland, yeah. To Richland? Richland, Washington, yeah. And tell us about James McGrath, because that was your teacher who I think really impacted you. Yeah, yeah, well, he was really an important uh, important teacher and in fact uh, the junior high teacher there that I often forget about Thelma Pearson woman she and Jim were very close friends and she also was uh, very supportive and Hudson Robert Hudson was also a co-student Bill Allen mm -hmm. another uh, what were they teaching you there in high school or exposing you to in the way of art oh just a variety of uh, media were available in, in both um, High school and junior high ceramics, jewelry, and uh, and we often uh, sent work to. There was a thing called Junior Scholastic, mm -hmm. and uh, Seattle uh, held, uh, hosted uh, shows, and so uh, we box up uh, work from Richland, uh, both in the junior high, watercolors, uh, drawings, uh, nothing too, not much in terms of painting as such. But, uh, <coughs> Anyway, uh, Richland always took all the prizes, just mm -hmm. uh, wiped everybody out. And when you went to Seattle, did you have a chance to meet some of the artists there, like uh, Toby or Morris Graves? Didn't didn't meet Toby or Graves, but uh, lesser known Guy Anderson. We visited his studio, and uh, a good friend of Jim McGrath's, uh, sculptor Phil McCracken, uh, and so spent time in their studios and with them. And McGrath is wonderful, making contacts and taking us around to various venues and uh, artists. And so, uh, Seattle was kind of the first big art experience I had with museums and that kind of thing. Yeah. Then, when it came time to get more serious about your art career, you enrolled at the San Francisco Art Institute on Russian Hill, formerly the uh, California School of Fine Arts. Yeah. And in fact, were you there when they changed their name? Yeah, I was. Yeah. 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 So tell us who was teaching there and who you studied with. Well, first I have to mention that I had a scholarship there. In fact, Alan Hudson and I all had scholarships, again, through this junior scholastic thing. So I had a scholarship the whole way through, which uh, really I was working construction in the summertime. And my dad wasn't too hot about me being a fine artist. He thought, architecture or engineering, something like not, that. Not an uncommon story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rare amongst us. Yeah. Uh, but they were supportive in other ways. Uh, Mom said, just go ahead, don't pay any attention. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he didn't have to pay for it. That, that eased the, <laughs> the burden some. So uh, uh, who was teaching there at the time? Uh, Nathan Oliveira. Uh, Richard Diebenkorn, uh, Elmer Bischoff, Frank Lovedell, uh, Jeremy Anderson, really great, uh, great teachers, wonderful. Uh, and students, uh, Manuel Neri, Joan Brown, uh, Bill Geis, uh, just really interesting. And it was a really significant time in the history of Bay Area art, of course. And were you conscious at the time that that this was that you guys were sort of making history, defining what uh, what the Bay Area would be known for? Well, I could tell something was going on because city lights had howl in the window, and right. I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd missed that reading, but uh, uh, Wally Hedrick, Jay DeFeo, some of you catch off. Interesting things were happening, and to me, a kid from Washington. Uh, it was all magic. It was just amazing, and uh, so I was uh, 
just happy up to my ears in, in art and artists, and uh, so it was wonderful, wonderful in the beginning, yeah. And while you were still, I think you were still a student when you made this painting, is that right? Yeah, Flake Zone, yeah. And uh, talk about, well, of course, you can see some abstract expressionist influence and Bay Area figurative school, artists who were doing representational work using AE techniques and whatnot. Yeah. What, what was this painting about? What motivated it in the first place? Uh, I would have to say some of it is based on what Ol Oliveira was doing at the time. I was very taken by the way he was using paint, but it also had to do with seeing Jasper John's target. Uh, and the flag paintings. Well, initially it was seeing that target on the cover of Art News. Okay. And it was, what the hell is that? You know, it was just, that's a painting. And then the flag paintings. And it kind of turned my mind and I towards uh, the States for the first time. Uh, because Seattle has a lot of Oriental influence and in Graves and Toby, a lot of that comes from Eastern uh, influence and so it kind of just made me start to focus on here rather than there mm -hmm. so. and how do you read the imagery it's some sort of abstract but uh, people have sort of interpreted it as, as figurative almost well the, I see the the centerpiece is a heart mm -hmm. that maybe a, could have come from seeing Jim Dine's work although I don't think I was aware of him at the time but kind of a still life with the flag flapping over overhead Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to be that obvious about the influence, so I kind of left it ambiguous. And I was just trying out stuff. I'd never worked with oil paint before I got to the Art Institute, so mm -hmm. that was a... And uh, in uh, the Northwest, uh, scale was uh, smaller in general than uh, I ran into at the Art Institute. People do these huge canvases and... Uh, well, you, uh, you must have been around when Jay DeFeo was working on the rose. Was yeah. Did you see it in her in, ever in her studio? I didn't. No. Uh, You've seen the movie, I imagine, where they had to move it out of there. Yeah. 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 And I remember hearing about it and uh, yeah. whole thing. And uh, Wally Hedrick, who was her partner at the time, right. was uh, teaching at the school, and uh, so there was awareness uh, in a loose way about that, but mm -hmm. uh, no particular uh, direct contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, now let's see, this is about the time you graduated, I guess. Yeah, I was, in, I was a graduate student at the time. Okay, and um, this is uh, from a series about Columbus, which kind of means a couple of things to you. You want to tell yeah. us about it? Uh, actually, the, the first one was a similar painting uh, called Columbus Rerouted Number 1, and it was a diptych. Uh, I was living in uh, Marin at the time. And uh, so I had to break it into two kind of six foot sections. And again, it was uh, kind of turning my attention to here rather than there. I think another thing uh, uh, in uh, Richland, McGrath uh, made us very aware of uh, the uh, indigenous people. He brought uh, Chief Wilson Charlie and his wife to uh, high school uh, to tell us about the broken Indian treaties and. Uh, I was there when Salilo Falls, where the Indians traditionally caught salmon, when that was uh, covered up by a dam. And uh, so it got me to thinking about the, the early voyages and, uh, and what if Columbus had been rerouted into some other, <laughs> some other place besides here, and uh, I think we would have suffered less than, uh, than, uh, than we're doing. But, uh, Anyway, it was the idea of uh, rerouting Columbus to some, some other land and uh, hopefully the indigenous people getting a better break than uh, they got a um, guy that, um, uh, Howard Sin, you know him? Uh, heard the name. Historian. Yeah, right. Yeah, he, he uh, heard him speaking one time and <clears throat> he said he wrote the People's History of the United States. <coughs> you familiar with that? Anyway, he said he, uh, found out that a teacher up in Oregon was teaching from, uh, uh, the, uh, from the book and um, he started getting letters from students saying, where do you get this kind of information about uh, all the terrible things Columbus uh, did? And he said that he, the teacher would start off the class by walking around and he'd see like a girl's purse on, the, uh, on her desk and he'd take it. And she'd say, you took my purse. And he'd say, no, I discovered it. 
<laughs> well, and he said the kids were writing to him saying, where are you getting this information? And he said, and I answered back, said, Columbus's diaries. Mm. And then uh, this is a painting called the Great Blondino self-portrait. Yeah. So is this is this an alter ego that we're looking at? <laughs> yeah, me blindfolded trying to make art, pushing it across the tightrope of our society. <laughs> and it also uh, became kind of a focus for a film that uh, uh, Robert Nelson, a uh, Bay Area filmmaker, and I did. He, we were friends, and he'd gotten into filmmaking and wanted to. Uh, do a film together, and I just did finish some of these uh, pieces we're going to see. And uh, <coughs> I took this from an old lithograph in a very old National Geographic, and it was Henry Blondin, who was a tightrope walker. Uh, uh, and uh, Nelson thought, in case we got into some trouble with uh, our depiction, we should add an O to Blondin and make it Blondino. Right, right. And so uh, we. Uh, we did that using a lot of the objects that I, I had in the studio at the time, which related to I mean, the wheelbarrow and the package and uh, so on and so forth. And, uh, and as we dedicate the film to tightrope walkers everywhere. Can people see that film anywhere? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's available through the uh, Canyon Cinema uh, thing in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and it was... Uh, there's some mention of it in the and some stills in the catalog. Yes, we I should mention we, we have here in our museum store a limited number of this wonderful catalog from Bill Wiley's retrospective at the Smithsonian. And he would be happy to sign them for anyone who buys one today after the conversation. And I, I'm not sure, but recently uh, the film archives in Los Angeles uh, had taken all the old film and uh, for restoration. Is it UCLA? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, now CDs, I think, are available, or DVDs are available. Excellent. Well, it's yeah. good that uh, that's all being preserved. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the white rhino injured. Mm -hmm. Who's the white rhino? Well, it's all of us. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, down in the corner of the Blondino painting, there, there's, there's a rhino there, uh, kind of down in the grass. And, uh, Is that in the lower, lower right hand there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right mm -hmm. there. Okay. And uh, so it was when they were starting to uh, slaughter uh, rhinos for their uh, aphrodisiac horn. Hmm. And uh, so I just caught some uh, news about that on some source. and. I'd also used this image I uh, found in a medical journal. It's uh, actually for applying a tourniquet and uh, a chain for uh, like a limb that's been amputated. You're using a rather neutral palette in these early paintings. So uh, why was that? I don't know. I think I, it was just something I was attracted to by osmosis. I have no idea what uh, was it. Was the film in black and white? Uh, no, it's, it's in color. It is in color. But right. so we made Blondino there. gray. Uh -huh. my, my brother Chuck played Blondino, and so we, <laughs> we grayed him up. And uh, my wife at the time made a suit just like Blondino. And he's you see him pushing a wheelbarrow around San Francisco and out at the zoo with the rhino. Uh, Richard Shaw. Uh, no, actually, it was Dan. Uh, uh, Dan, I can't think of his last name, and made this huge chair. And so we have, uh, since the rhino's in the painting, we, we have Blondino visit the, the rhinoceros uh, pit at uh, San Francisco Zoo. We brought in this big chair, and, and so Blondino is sitting there watching the rhino. Rhino got very upset, starts pacing back and forth and pacing back and forth. You see the film, you'll see it. Nelson did some interesting things with his feet at the time. And uh, just as we finished filming, somebody alerted the zoo folks and a guard came running up and says what are you doing here and what what's that big chair for and that beast is very upset and that's a 14 foot pit and he can lift 15 feet so you better get out of here <laughs> so we picked up the chair and blondino and off we went <laughs> okay then i guess this is one of your early assemblages mixed media works uh, two of them yeah. 
Can you tell us uh, what the materials are and what they're about? Well, the one on the left is uh, two questions preserved in olive oil and distilled vinegar. And uh, <laughs> 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 I was trying lots of stuff in those days, <laughs> hoping it might be art in some form. Anyway, well, a lot of artists are making art with food materials today, so this is a pretty early example of that. Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time, I yeah. guess, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> just trying lots of stuff. And there were a lot of influences around uh, Bruce Connor, for one, mm -hmm. uh, some of his uh, medicine bag out in nylon stockings and things. I saw a show of his right after he got into town and was really uh, moved very much by uh, Bruce's work. And uh, so, uh, it was um, just some, actually a painting that I made, and then I didn't, wasn't happy with the painting, and yet I put all that time in on it. So I decided to preserve it in, in thus form. And uh, then got... Has, it, has that, is it still, does that piece still exist? Is it still in oh, condi yeah. good condition or not? I, I doubt it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know its providence. Some, some things became too uh, cumbersome and noxious to, uh, <laughs> to keep around, so uh, you know, I don't know where it is, actually. <laughs> and how about the, uh, the wax piece? The easel there? preserved in wax. Yeah. yeah, I just got the idea of using a wax to, um, in fact, uh, just recently, a film that uh, Bill Allen and I did uh, has resurfaced. I didn't know what had happened to it and found out that it was... Uh, uh, rediscovered in the garage recently, and this was 1960 or something. We shot the film, and it relates to this in that I was using wax, and what I did, I had a big block of wax and got a, an electric iron and turned it on, and it just melted into the wax. And so this was I used a number of pieces that uh, where I was just I I like the way it looked, you know, like a piece in the ice somehow. It seemed, Mm. You know, something uh, embedded in ice. And, uh, it has a general, almost just a voice quality about it. In that oh regard. yeah, I never thought about that with the grease and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> now this one, uh, much more elaborate <laughs> approach to assemblage. Yeah. And, uh, and of course assemblage was really thriving in the Bay Area by this time, right? Yeah. 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 And Bill Allen, who, like I said, I knew in uh, high school, uh, had uh, uh, been in Seattle for a while and then moved down to uh, San Francisco and uh, had a studio nearby. And he was working with sheet lead. And so I thought, oh, I'd like to work with that. So this was a piece, basically, the back, the Enigma doggy who's puking on the floor there. Uh, he's uh, in sheet lead and uh, an acrylic over the top. and. Uh, the thing on front was a, a construction piece of painting, basically, that I did and didn't like and kind of crunched it and added it. <laughs> you know, trying to recycle so, everything. I was going to say, you were recycling too, yeah. which artists do a lot now, and it's an right. early example of that. So yeah. Pioneered more things than you realized. <laughs> Desperation. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a great story about the slant step, and uh, the work has text on it, so I uh, printed out the text for you so you can read what's inscribed on the slant step. But the slant, that's a name you came up with, right? Uh, actually, I think Bruce, Bruce Nauman came, Bruce up, with came up with it. Uh, tell us the story of the slant step. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> uh, I was living in Mill Valley at the time, had a great studio, an old church in Mill Valley, and Bruce, who was a student, a uh, graduate student at Davis at the time, uh, came down for a visit, and I took him down to the Mount Carmel salvage shop to show him this strange little slanted stool that I'd seen in there. And the original is covered with green linoleum and has kind of a rubber underbacking and mm. plywood. And uh, so we got it out and looked at it for a while and uh, thought it was very strange and finally put it back. And um, so uh, uh, next week when I was back up at school, uh, Bruce says, I keep thinking about that little slanted, <laughs> that little slanted step. He said, uh, why don't you go buy it and bring it up and uh, I think I want to do some stuff with it. So I went down to the salvage shop and uh, brought it up for the ladies that ran it to buy and they said, oh, we can't sell that. That's 
how we get things off the top shelf. And they, <laughs> and they, no, that that doesn't work. It slides right off of it. And uh, so uh, I said, well, how much do you want for it? And they said, mm, 50 cents. Okay. <laughs> so I took it up to Bruce, and he did a modern version. And uh, then he and Bill Allen made a, a kind of National Geographic, how to make your own slant step film. <laughs> and <clears throat> then we got an opportunity to uh, do a group show at uh, uh, a gallery called the Berkeley Gallery, which started in Berkeley, but it subsequently moved to uh, San Francisco. And we had a lot of meetings at my studio, a lot of group of artists that were going to participate in this show.